Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi emphasized dialogue and non-confrontation when greeting returning diplomats from the now-closed Houston consulate. So why has the U.S. side rebuffed China's overtures and de-escalation? Wang Yi made an inspection tour of Tibet while Indian Prime Minister Modi rallied crowds with the slogan of territorial sovereignty. Do these actions reflect the border talks behind the scenes? Welcome to The Point, coming to you live from Beijing. I'm Li Qiuyuan, sitting in for Liu Xin. On Monday, Chinese State Councilor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi greeted Chinese diplomats back from the Chinese consulate in Houston that was ordered shut by the U.S. government last month. On the same day, Trump threatened to ban more Chinese companies as bilateral tensions now continue on multiple fronts, including diplomatic, tech, and military. The Center for Strategic and International Studies says the U.S. lacks a, quote, clear strategy for countering the problems. Now, their article, From Competition to Confrontation with China, the Major Shift in U.S. Policy, also analyzes the drastic shift in America's China policy by examining four recent speeches given by top U.S. officials. So, are these just a political ploy to gain votes, or will it characterize China-U.S. relations going forward? Joining me to discuss this topic are Stanley Kober, defense and foreign affairs analyst and former research fellow in foreign policy at Cato Institute, and also Professor Jia Hai, research fellow at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Thank you so much for joining us. Let me first start with Mr. Kober. Um, we want to take a first look at what Foreign Minister Wang Yi has said at the welcoming ceremony earlier at the airport. Let's take a listen. All of our colleagues at the Consulate General in Houston remain calm in the emergency when the U.S. violated the basic principles of international relations and ordered the closure of the consulate. All of you have kept in mind that you were entrusted by our nation and people and fulfilled your duties as diplomats. At a very difficult and even dangerous situation, you firmly safeguarded China's core interests, the dignity of the state and the legitimate rights of the consulate. That was the foreign minister. And other than that, he also said dialogue and non-confrontation is still the mainstream opinion among the public in both countries. Well, actually, this is not the first time for him to express his confidence that China-U.S. relations will be reborn after the current difficulties. But, Mr. Colbert, I'm curious, from your perspective, what kind of message is he trying to send out by showing confidence and using words like dialogue and non-confrontation when it comes to China-U.S. relations. How are you looking at it? Um, I would agree with that. I like to have dialogue. Uh, it's one of the reasons I'm here. Um, but right now, I have to admit, with a lot of my colleagues, um, it, it's really very difficult. There is something about this idea of great power competition um, that in Washington is widespread. Um, people, I, I don't think this is just the election. Um, there is something more fundamental going on here. Um, the Thucydides trap, the idea of the great power rising, we had this even with Japan in the early 1990s. I was amazed by this. Now it's China. And it, it concerns me. Um, I was very hopeful. I was a student in the Soviet Union wrote my doctoral dissertation on Soviet-American relations, very similar but the opposite of that CSIS title, from confrontation to negotiation. Now we have the great power competition, it's like Cold War is back. I am really very concerned about where all of this is heading. There's very little dialogue anymore. When you were in our show last time, Mr. Kober, you said things were happening uh, that were ominous. However, with the pace of tensions ratcheting up, the U.S. and China have close to their respective consulates, the U.S. banning Chinese tech companies. Mm -hmm. What kind of word would you use to describe the relationship now? Um, it's, it's a downhill spiral, and I, I regard this as very tragic. I see the, the world now when the students came over here, the Chinese students, during the Cold War, we did not have this. And they came here to learn from us. 
we talk about conflict of values in, in addition to Thucydides' trap. I honestly never get that from the students. I remember the first Chinese law student I met here. Once during exams, I asked what she was studying, and she replied, American zoning regulations. When Chinese young people come over here to study things like our zoning regulations, I see some hope for the future. Um, this is what concerns me most of all. Um, when I talk to the students who are still here, there, uh, there is a sense of disenchantment and disillusionment. Um, some recent graduates I know. This disturbs me most of all, that we are losing the next generation. Let me now bring in Professor Zhao Hai. He is joining us on the phone this time. Uh, Professor, in the analysis of China-U.S. relations provided by the Center for Strategic and International Studies, the author points out that by focusing solely on China's actions as allegedly stemming from a communist ideology, it fails to take into account the historical motivation for global prominence, such as its humiliation in opium wars. Um, how are you looking at this? What's in it for the U.S. to ignore these parts of China's history to fit their narrative? Well, first of all, Mr. Korsman's analysis of the four speeches are very good, uh, excellent, deep uh, analysis. And point, he correctly pointed out that uh, there's a big uh, missing picture in the entire analysis from the current U.S. government, uh, which is, of course, they only focus on the ideological part uh, of the bilateral relations and totally ignored uh, first the Chinese history and uh, what Chinese people ex it has experienced in the past 200 years and also the past 40 uh, decades, four decades of progress uh, in China under the uh, rule of uh, the Chinese uh, uh, Party, uh, Chinese Communist Party. So the problem is the current uh, U.S. government, the Trump administration, is not ignorant of the Chinese history. They're intentionally excluding those useful history because they want to motivate domestic support against China. So that they know very well that they need to depict China the more like the former Soviet Union, the better, because they can incite this uh, Cold War sentiment and uh, infuse and impose fear uh, to American people so that they will uh, turn against China more and more to support their radical uh, current uh, administration's policy against China. So I think this is not uh, some, somehow that these people don't know about Chinese history. If you look at the composition of the uh, Pompeo team or the team in the National Security Council, those people, a lot of them knew very well the Chinese history. It, it is just that they pick the, uh, uh, the part of the history and also part of useful information to support their argument. And their argument, of course, if you look at the current, the most recent Pew research, uh, that actually 57 percent of American people does not support the current administration's China policy. So that means their willful uh, ignorance or uh, take and pick, uh, cherry picking of history is only running against American people's common sense and their sense of the real progress on the Chinese side. So I think mm -hmm. this uh, uh, research is very useful to open uh, more eyes in uh, Washington, D.C. Yeah, history is such a big deal when it comes to policy direction here in China. Now, besides some hypothetical situations brought up in the speeches by top U.S. officials, including U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, some, especially in the National Security Advisor O'Brien's speech, did provide explicit examples of alleged tempering in the United States by China. So, Mr. Kober, I want to get your thoughts on this. Even if these allegations are true, why are these officials only commenting on them now, and why in speeches instead of in direct conversations with officials on the Chinese side? Um, it, it reflects a general attitude, and part of my concern is, you know, that this is bipartisan. I mean, you know, I, I see this, there's a sense of, you know, the, as I said, the great power competition that comes up the need for deterrence of China, that you prevent war through deterrence. And if you, say, go back to Winston Churchill's history of the Second World War, um, when he discusses Munich, he's actually very gracious towards Chamberlain. Um, and he says, how, he asks, how many wars have been prevented by goodwill? 
you don't always prevent war by confrontation and deterrence. Sometimes negotiation and goodwill is the better approach. And as that was my hope for the future with it when I saw all the students here. But now everything is deterrence. All the articles I read are about deterrence. And to be honest, I'm getting concerned that I'm seeing this now reciprocated in China. During the Cold War, we spoke of an action-reaction phenomenon. I'm now seeing this. I was reading articles in the Chinese press yesterday um, about deterrence, even suggesting that China send military aircraft over Taiwan to demonstrate resolve. I think that would be extremely dangerous. Hmm. But I'm, I'm seeing this action-reaction phenomenon, much as we discussed it during the Cold War. This is making me very apprehensive. I think we, both sides need to pull back a little bit. That's why when you began by talking about dialogue still, I hope we can still do that. And also, this liberal focus of events and incidents that fit the U.S. narrative is addressed by the report from CSIC, which points out how the U.S. focuses on the CPC's alleged human rights abuses while ignoring its efforts to fight abject poverty in China. Uh, Mr. Kober, how does such editing work to shape popular sentiment against China? Um, what sort of message is this meant to convey here? <laughs> It is a focus on China. We do focus on human rights. But this is what I mean. You, you can discuss these issues. Uh, one thing I noticed, for example, an issue is Xinjiang, very prominent here. But I noticed the Chinese foreign ministry, um, uh, maybe a month or two ago, the spokesperson at the regular press briefing invited Secretary Pompeo to visit Xinjiang. I haven't seen any follow-up on that. I thought that was noteworthy. Um, but I, I haven't seen any, any you know, really discussion of it here. Um, it seems to me these sorts of overtures um, should be followed up. These, these issues, if people show goodwill and have discussion, this is what I meant about the Chinese law student being here. You can discuss these issues. They don't have to be confrontational. Professor Zhao, how would you respond to what's been said here? And what's happening here? Is it just a political ploy to gain votes, or will it characterize China-U.S. relations going forward? Well, I think there are two things I want to emphasize. Uh, first of all, there's no real consensus on how to deal with China in the U.S. right now. There's a, a lot of debates, a lot of discussions. Uh, and right now, as the Cor uh, Mr. Korsman's report from CSIS pointed out, that, uh, you know, uh, there's a sudden change uh, on the uh, foreign policy from the U.S. towards China from uh, competition directly to confrontation. And right now, as I said before, you know, confrontation towards China is not a consensus on the U.S. side. Recently, there are many scholars uh, written articles uh, arguing against uh, Pompeo's uh, idea of pushing U.S.-China relations towards a new Cold War. That means even in Washington, D.C., there's no consensus. Now, turns to the human rights issue. Uh, China has long uh, depicted uh, human rights not only in political terms, but also in economic terms. China said development is also human rights. In the UN Human Rights Council, the U.S. refused to recognize development as human rights, and that's a fundamental problem right now. As the uh, professor said, you know, we should have discussion of the meaning of human rights and then complement each other instead of pointing fingers. At this point, and Xinjiang is a point, it's a very much uh, it's a very good case when Xinjiang has progress bringing people to work to the factories, and all of a sudden the U.S. have no evidence, and then came out to say those people are forced labor, and now U.S. is unilaterally imposing sanctions against Chinese companies. So I think without negotiation, without talks, without dialogue, without negotiation, this unilateral. Um, action from the U.S. side will not work. Yeah, with all these hotspot issues, how can the two sides reconcile their differences and put their relations back on track remains a question. Thank you very much to my guests, Mr. Stanley Kober, Defense and Foreign Affairs Analyst, and Professor Jiahai, Research Fellow from China Academy of Social Sciences. Thank you for your analysis.